The blood is for the life. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall eat the blood of no manner of flesh, for the life of all flesh is in the blood. Whosoever eateth it shall... Stay back! No, oh, it's you. My goodness, forgive me. Uh, sorry about that. It's very rude to point guns at people. Uh, forget that ever happened. Well, welcome to Charles Classic Vlog. I am your host, Charles Cubanks, and today I shall be finishing the two-part review of Bram Stoker's Dracula. <laughs> Okay. So, it's been over a week and a half since I did the last part, and uh, to be honest, it's been extremely difficult getting this out. I've done over two dozen takes now, and the last one that actually I got all the way through with was over 40 minutes long. I don't have time for that. You don't have time for that. And Anybody got time for that? Quiet, woman. <laughs> but she's right. So, rather than, you know, just expound, you know, mellifluously on every single subject that could be expounded upon, I am going to time myself this time. Try to keep it under 30 minutes long. I have two watches on. And, uh, this fellow, whom I shall name Jackson. Yes, the clock. Um, so, when the long hand gets to the twelve, that is when I shall conclude this little meeting. So, let's get started. First of all, is this synopsis. Now, I would have read the synopsis from the book that I own, but uh, it's a Barnes & Noble version with only a small excerpt, one paragraph, which actually reveals the fate of one of the main characters. So... Rather than do that to you and slap you upside the head with a spoiler right off the bat, I shall be reading my own that I have written. So, if you will humor me, listen carefully, I shall do so. Here we go. A young barrister, basically an attorney, named Jonathan Harker takes a trip to Transylvania in order to aid a certain count in buying property in England, and shipping his belongings there. As he draws closer to the castle Dracula, he experiences many unnerving supernatural occurrences which cause him to take pause in his journey, but he is determined not to succumb to the superstitions of the townspeople who try to keep him from his purpose. He meets the Count, however, and while he is disturbed by the Count's pallor and strange habits, as well as his massive labyrinthine castle. He is also calmed by the Count's gentlemanly charm, and agrees to stay the week to rest and finish the Count's business, but ends up staying much longer than he anticipated. Meanwhile, his soon-to-be fiancée Mina and her friend Lucy are discussing how she was just proposed to by three different men, one a psychiatrist, one a nobleman, and one an American. After over two months of hearing nothing from Jonathan, they begin to fear the worst, and they are right to fear, for Harker is soon finding that he is but a pawn in the Count's diabolical schemes, and also a prisoner, and everyone he loves is in danger of being sacrificed to Dracula's insatiable bloodlust. With the help of an eccentric Dutch professor, Van Helsing, it is up to them all to defeat the vampire menace. But at what cost? Pretty nice, eh? A little dramatic, but not more than most plot summaries. So, what of the plot? Well, it is a little formulaic. I mean, on face value, it's just, you know, a beast is starting to kill people. And the town, pe town you know, must rise up and kill the beast. But... That's not the only plot. The, that's just the main one. Uh, the, the main plot is just a vehicle for the character development. And uh, there are many subplots, as many subplots as there are characters. And 
as you've probably heard, there are over eight characters, main characters. Um, so, uh, these are some of the, the subplots that it actually gets to. Um, there's the subplot of information. If the characters know more about Dracula, they will be able to defeat him. Uh, know thine enemy, as I said last time. And it's extremely important. The more they know, the more the plot is changed. And that's extremely interesting, because at the first, they know absolutely nothing. They don't know that Dracula is a monster. Jonathan Harker very slowly comes to the realization that all of the superstitions of the townspeople are actually true, and he must escape the castle. So there's that subplot. And then there's Mina and Lucy. Lucy is being proposed to by three different men, just because she's so beautiful. And she has to, you know, get through those emotions, and so do all those three characters. So, them not knowing what's happening to them really ups the tension. It's extremely tense all throughout, and that's part of the greatness of the writing. Um, you are aware that this is a vampire book, but the characters are not. It forces you to say over and over again, oh, if only they knew, you know, if only they would share their understanding of Dracula with others, then they might be able to save themselves. But, of course, they don't until the last minute, and all these terrible things happen. So, that's a few subplots right there. And there's the subplot of insanity. Um, one of the characters, main characters, named uh, Renfield, he is actually insane, and uh, he's not the only one. Dracula, you know, is definitely insane himself, but in a very different way. Um, then there's Dr. Seward, the psychiatrist, one of the three suitors that, you know, is in love with Lucy, at least supposedly. So there's that subplot of true love and affection. E the, those three suitors, each one are trying to not manipulate, but, well, maybe manipulate Lucy into loving them more. Um, she does choose, however, and each one has to deal with that emotion as well. And um, the fact that there's a vampire involved allows for a lot, a lot of, of good, you know, stressful moments where each of the characters has to decide, do they really love Lucy like they thought? Are they really as loyal and gentlemanly as they claimed to be? And so there's that. Then there's self-sacrifice, and that's part of the love triangle as well. Well, actually, love rectangle. And then, interestingly enough, there is women's rights. is an extremely important plot subject in Dracula, and you never hear anything about that, but uh, other than maybe the whole bodice-breaking idea of the vampire genre, that the vampire is in this gray area of love and lust, and he has to break down the moral constraints of the society and of the woman at large and um, seduce her so that she can experience true love and affection in a passion that is, you know, completely free and all that hogwash. Um, now, I, you know, I get the reasons why that flies so well in this modern culture, but that's not the way that Dracula approaches it. Um, he approaches it, well, Bram Stoker approaches it, Dracula doesn't approach women very respectfully at all, although he does not seduce anyone. Sex and sexuality are not a major player in this book, as I said in the first discussion part of this review. This one is more of the analysis. But uh, it hardly appears, the sexuality aspect. If it appears at all, it is extremely subtle. Subtlety is something that I love out of this book. There's so much subtlety. Every one of these subplots is implied. And uh, so there's a lot going on behind the scenes, a lot going on subconsciously with each of the characters, a lot going on in the subconscious of the reader. Um, like I said, you know that this is a vampire book, and you have lots of ideas about in your head already about what a vampire is, and you probably have some 
you know, little fears about what's going to happen anyway. So there's that tension as well. You know something's going to go wrong. You know the vampire is going to show up. But when and how, and how the characters are going to respond to Dracula, that's where the meat of the story actually lies. Um, but it, it leans more heavily on how those characters relate to each other, not just to Dracula. So, that's the plot. I love the plot. Um, I'm going to say that about everything in this book, basically. But next is the writing. It is written in first-person epistolary writing, and that just means, uh, you know, epistle basically means a letter. So the book is written from the perspective of each character's journal entries, and their journal entries alone. Everyone basically has a journal, and those who don't are basically forced to in order to keep that level of understanding between the characters, that save this knowledge, that if they fail in their attempt to defeat Dracula, if they die, then that account that they write down will be able to help someone else. It's it's very interesting. It's kind of like the whole, you know, Cloverfield effect, um, or, you know, Blair Witch Project, or what else? Uh, you know, kind of the X-Files, I guess. Because it's something that you are looking at as a reader, coming from the outside, you're not actually in the minds of anyone. It's not third person, it's not God perspective. So, it's like you've taken the files of this murder mystery and are looking over them, page by page, character by character, and you're learning about it through their eyes, but not through their eyes. I, you get the idea. <laughs> and that's extremely brilliant, um, because it allows for a level of character development that no third-person writing can allow. And... Uh, you see into their fears, their desires, everything about them is told. It's like, if you looked into a journal of a normal person, I mean, <laughs> in real life, then that's the type of thing that you would see in it. There's lots of emotional turmoil um, with the ladies, with the men, there's a lot less, but uh, there's still a lot of emotion going on. They try to hide it, but it's always there. So, I only have 15 minutes left. Okay, keep going! Tension is all throughout the book, leads up to the climax, it's like constantly that that bass sound, that cello is just ramping up the entire time. The writing changes from person to person. Um, you hear the voice of every individual, and every individual is extremely unique and different. So, that's incredible, just to maintain that kind of cohesion between so many different characters in first person. That's... that's insanity. That's amazing. Anyway, so, let's get into the characters. What do their journals actually say about them? So first off, and in order of appearance, is Jonathan Harker, of course. Uh, he starts out as kind of a dorky tourist. He's going, you know, through Europe to get to Castle Dracula. And he's writing down, you know, all of these recipes, these great European recipes that he's never, you know, heard of and he loves. And he wants to write them down so that Mina can cook them for him and so that he can learn to cook them because he wants to become something of a culinary artist himself. And, you know, there's tons of character development in that. But then he gets to the castle and stuff starts getting real, if I may use the modern cliché. And he becomes kind of an action hero. He starts doing things that no one else would do in that situation. Of course, you know, being engaged, you know, is a really good motivation <laughs> to survive. But, uh, so he, he, he's a dork tourist, action hero, then he becomes a paralyzed victim, um, it's very realistic what happens to him. It's like PTSD settles in, post-traumatic stress disorder, and uh, the characters have to basically take care of him because of everything that he's gone through until at last he has to rise up once more against the beast and lead the charge. He comes then, and... So, Jonathan Harker is interesting, awe-inspiring as a hero figure, but... 
yet extremely relatable. He seems like the main character, but he's actually not. He gets a fairly little amount of screen time in this book, page time, I guess. But he is a very powerful character. You want him to be the main character, but his journal entries cut off after a certain period of time, and you're like, what just happened to Jonathan Harker? Which is exactly what Mina and Lucy and all of his friends are thinking. So, so next in order of appearance is the titular character, Dracula. He is a rich aristocrat, like most representations of him show, but he's not seductive. Um, well, and that's changed over the years quite a lot. Um, the original vampire genre was based off of the vampire being extremely seductive. But Bram Stoker takes the high road this time and uh, chooses to show Dracula in more of a monstrous light. He's extremely intelligent because he's lived for over 300 years. Um, and that's probably the most frightening thing about him, but he is an antagonist. He's a classic villain. Uh, he always wears black, you know. He taunts his enemies. He laughs at them, you know, in the psychotic laughter of someone who's been to the underworld and back. But uh, an interesting thing about Dracula, uh, the, the interesting thing, the most unique thing that Bram Stoker did with the vampire genre was created this character. The reason why it's interesting is not because he's in it a lot, not because he gets lots of development, but because Bram Stoker connected him with the actual historical figure of Vlad the Impaler, who, you know, you guessed it, impaled people on spikes in his front yard. Yes, a very charming, seductive count. Wouldn't you want to marry him? Uh, he's the exact same character as Vlad the Impaler, the hero of the boyars in Wallachia. Just look up that history yourself. It's extremely fascinating. So that, that means that this character has all of that battle history as he did in life. But also, he has a very different mental aspect to him. He's been dead for a long time, and his brain has been growing in a different way because he's been taken over by a curse. That's another thing that's different. He is cursed by what he did in life uh, because he was so cruel. And, you know, his wife actually committed suicide after a while, and the priest told Dracula... Uh, that's the noble name of Vlad the Impaler, Dracula. Um, the priest told him that his wife was actually accursed and had to float around as a spirit, um, cursed in hell, you know, um, as well. And I think that is something Bram Stoker used to his advantage to grow the character. He actually used that curse thing and imputed it to the vampire genre. So it's not something scientific, it's not something that intellectual, it's spiritual. The vampire is a supernatural villain. Uh, he is a demon, um, basically, in human flesh. But that allows Dracula to do so many different things, um, many more things than most modern you know, occurrences of, of Dracula. He can shapeshift um, into beams of moonlight, interestingly enough. He can shapeshift into almost any kind of dark animal. Um, modern day, we have this strange idea that the vampire is opposed to the werewolf, whereas in Dracula, and in all previous representations of the vampire, the vampire could change into a werewolf at any given moment. Not only a vampire bat, which he does in, in Dracula, but also into a werewolf, and that's incredibly freaky. And it's used to great effect in the book. Uh, he can even change into fog. He can stretch himself and make him small so that he can fit into, you know, constricted areas. I mean, where have you ever seen that in a movie? Um, so there's all of this, and it's probably... That's probably the reason that this book became so popular. 
is because he could basically do anything. Um, his weaknesses are many, but they're much fewer than, you know, you see in, a, you know, this massive conglomeration of weaknesses that have built up over time. There's garlic and the cross and the sacraments. Those are the things that he fears. So, there's more to be said about Dracula, but I have to move on. I only have about five minutes left with you. Then, in next in appearance, is Mina Harper. She's independent, intelligent, and strong. Um, she's also quirky and enjoyable, and she also has fun, and which is really realistic because you know, girls just wanna have fun. <clears throat> um, she actually appears most in the story, and I think, in my personal opinion, after reading the book a couple of times because I liked it so much, that she is actually the main character, and. It's actually because of her that, uh, eh, never mind. Just read the book. But she is integral to the plot, but also to the furthering of the theme of women's rights. Um, that women are not only to be seen, but heard. Um, if they don't hear her in this book, then so much crud goes down. And, um, it's all up to the men, basically. But... The fact is that the vampire is coming after all of them, and the women have lots of understanding, lots of knowledge, because of the circumstances. And if the men don't talk to them, then the vampire will have that much more of an advantage. And he uses it every time, because he's so in intellectual. Uh, the vampire, you know, he kidnaps the people. He steals identities, even. He, um cat burgles, etc., etc., etc. He's not just... You know, that's, that's part of the intricacy of this character, Mina. Um, she actually becomes a stenographer. You know, how crazy, woman! You're like a man! Becoming a stenographer? Jeez. Such a spectacle. But, um, and that's, that's kind of the, uh, the time period coming out. But it's something that makes the plot great. Uh, so, moving on. Lucy Westenra. Yes, you heard right. Westenra. It's a Dutch Irish name. And that's why it's so weird. She is the local beauty, the girly girl, the ditz of the group. She's innocently selfish. Uh, because, you know, over three different men came after her. What kind of person do you have to be in order for that to happen? But... When things go down, she has to become her true self. The mask comes off, and she actually turns out to be wise, calm, and intelligent. And she regrets a lot of her past, you know, ditziness, getting these three men, loyal men, involved in this. Her character's been twisted so many times in popular fiction and fan fiction and films but she is something much deeper than all of that here. And there's lots of spoilers connected with her, uh, so I'll move on again. Then there's the suitors. Dr. Seward is the psychiatrist who owns his own asylum, and um, he is extremely interesting, because it seems as though he owns this asylum, and he's dealing with psychosis not just to help the afflicted, but, it, you know, the more you read, the more you realize he's looking for a cure for psychosis so that he himself can be saved from something going on in his own mind, which is infinitely interesting. Um, he's also very obsessed with the idea of curing psychosis, and specifically with treating one particular character, and I'll come to that later. So, he's very loyal, he's very gentlemanly, he's loving, he's, an, he's a great hero figure, but at the same time, there's that little thing that's going on in the background that no one really addresses, or comes out in the open until after the book, that uh, needed to be addressed. It's because of him that a lot of bad stuff happens, uh, because he's wanting to get to this psychological, you know, state of ecstasy, basically. Very Freudian. Um, he, he actually mentions Freud multiple times, and, 
So, yes, that's that's Dr. Seward. Next is Quincy Morris, the American from Texas. He is rich, he wears white all the time, and he carries a revolver in his back pocket. Um, kind of tight back there, but anyway. So he, you know, he takes pot shots at Dracula, which is awesome. He's basically Chuck Norris in the 1890s. And that's really all I can say. Um, he's probably the most cliched character in the book. But if you think about it, that's probably how the UK thought of Americans back then. You know, it's just, you know, I got my gun. Come with me, honey. We'll shoot the vampire. And that's as far as it goes. But it's not all negative. It's, you know, he's loyal. He's powerful. And uh, he truly wants everyone to survive, and he does his darndest to, to make that happen. Next is Arthur Homewood, and uh, he, he is not so interesting. He basically has a lot of money, and he's a gentleman. Really gentlemanly. He's the, he's the action hero that everyone needs. Jonathan Harker is not on the scene. So, that's all I can say about him. He is the least developed. Um, yeah, moving on. Poor guy. Anyway, so, God, I'm going to put him as a main character in this. And that seems silly, but there's a reason why. Um, I'm going to read a quote here in a second by Frank Cupola, who directed the movie adaptation called Bram Stoker's Dracula in 1992. And he said this about God and about the story of Dracula. Quote, unquote. It's about the sacrament, and it's also about God's ultimate responsibility and pledge to us, as well as ours to God, because God is an element in this story, and in the whole question of evil, God plays a role. End quote. And that's from The Blood is the Life, The Making of Dracula by Frank Capota. And that's kind of an understatement, because without God, without Christianity, without Catholicism, there would be no defeating of Dracula. It's because of the whole, you know, good and evil presented in Christ the Christian religion, in, you know, Christian, Judeo-Christianity, that Dracula exists, even, in our popular culture. God is unquestionably the most important character in the book. It is by him that the characters are to succeed. And uh, another character, who is probably the main character to, you know, to, to mention, will sing. And uh, it is because of him that the characters realize that this is a supernatural occurrence. This, he, uh, he actually states in the book, a supernatural question requires a supernatural answer. And that's what he brings to the table, is the willingness to look into the idea, even, that the spiritual world actually exists. And all of the characters are Christian. They, you know, they attest to the fact that, that there is salvation through Jesus Christ, but they're less willing to admit that there is a spiritual dimension, that there are angels and demons that actually do things. And Van Helsing brings up to them that if they don't believe in them, then they cannot defeat Dracula, because Dracula is of the demonic, you know, suit card. That's, that's God. Now Van Helsing. He was actually um, based on an actual character from history, like Dracula, um, named Abraham Van Helsing. And he headed up a kind of a secret society, shady business, dedicated to protecting the queen from vampires and from occult threats. And that's, that's just insane. That's awesome. I wish I knew about that. But uh, that's part of, you know, the intelligence, the brilliance of... Bram Stoker in bringing in this historical feel to the vampire genre, which was only based on fiction and fantasy and horror before. And Van Helsing is odd, let me tell you. Um, 
he he has this accent and this way of speaking in the book, and he's Dutch, so that's part of it. But he he speaks almost like a child, and his speech impediment I'm going to call it just an impediment becomes something of a bore. It becomes really annoying, and it detracts from his character. At first, it's, you know, it's like, oh, how cute is that old Dutch man, you know, oh, he's European, he can't speak English. But in fact, I've never, you know, seen or heard of a Dutch person, a really, like a professor, a doctor, who couldn't speak English well. So that seems like a bunch of baloney coming from Bram Stoker, um, that a Dutchman, a professor no less, couldn't speak English well. I mean, come on. So that's that's the main detractor from Van Helsing, but he's awesome. He brings in, you know, the 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 ideas about the cross, the the sacrament. Um, he cares about all of the characters like they're his own sons and daughters. And um, he brings the people together, and uh, and they pray together, they cry together, they weep, they laugh together, even in different parts. And he he brings them all to the point of no return, so that they can save the lives of all those involved and defeat Dracula. So that's all the time that I have, but. Uh, in, in my parting shots, I have to say the ending is actually very anticlimactic. It just kind of ends, just, you know, and we're done! And, uh, and that's it. There is a very short one page afterward about what happened to the characters, which I'm very grateful for, but it's, uh, it's, it's very sudden. It's like, oh, okay. You know, you've been building to this massive height of tension, and then, you know, whack, bang, pow, and it's done. It's over with. Uh, one of the characters dies. It's very tragic, but it ends very quickly, which is probably the main problem with, with the book, in my opinion. But it is very small in terms of, you know, in comparison with the grandiose nature of this classic. And, uh... You know, Bram Stoker set out just to thrill his audience with something new, and he did it. He succeeded with flying colors. Let's let's just give Bram Stoker applause if if we can. Yes, good job, Bram Stoker. Way to go! All right, yeah. Uh, uh, uh. Wow, that's a bit much, guys. Quiet down, now. Quiet down. Thank you. Thank you. So, that was the review for Dracula, and I give this book three black fedoras. That's how much I like this book. Out of three, I think, he gets three black fedoras. If there were four, then it would probably be four, but that's all I have right now. So, if you enjoyed that review, if you want me to continue writing these reviews and reading them out for you, basically. Of course, this one I didn't do that as much, because I wanted to get through it quickly. Then, like, subscribe, and uh, keep reading. I can finally move on to what was second in line, something a little less heavy in the science fiction genre, Isaac Asimov's Foundation. Thanks for watching, and God bless.